regular meeting of the Citrus County School Board. And our opening exercises are Mr. Dodd. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just had a little comment to make. I thought uh, the fact that we're in this uncharted territory uh, these days, a lot of uncertainties and a lot of unknowns, um, it makes people feel uneasy and rightfully so, but I wanted to talk about some of the knowns, some things that we do know. I mean, you know, we know that uh, we're here because we all want what's best for children. You know, we know that we've got to continue to teach children, allow them to have the opportunity to learn, to provide for free public education. We know that parents want choices. They want to be able to make decisions for the best interest of their children. And we want to honor that. We know, too, though, that we have some of the most talented teachers, creative, willing to go the extra mile for their students, and that when we all work together, uh, we know that we can get through this. It's not going to be easy, and there's going to be a lot of times when people are going to question what's happening. But when we work together, when we look at the talent that we have, when we look at our desire to do what's right for children, we're going to make it, make through this. We're going to make it through. We are. Let's to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Master John, for the very kind words and the very true of this district. Um, Move to the uh, adoption of the agenda as recommended by Superintendent Himmel. I mean, the agenda is recommended by I have a motion by Mrs. Powers, a second by Mrs. Bryant to adopt the agenda as recommended by Superintendent Himmel. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes 5 five zero. Um, approval of the consent agenda. Um, I need to say something, because for those people that are watching, the consent agenda is, is quite lengthy, but it's it's taken hours for our staff and some of our committee members to produce some of the documents in there, and they're well worth your time looking at it. Ms. Humbaugh, um, your equity report was, was great. Ms. Kirby isn't in here, but, but she had several things that she did for her ESC children. So I don't want to cite those things when we put things like that that staff has worked very hard on, um, and we throw it in consent. Uh, so. So know that we appreciate what you do behind the scenes, and our questions are always answered, so y'all are right. So I'll uh, entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Move approval. Second. I have a motion by Mrs. Bryant, a second by Mr. Dodd to approve the consent agenda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes 5-0. And we recognize the donations of our community to several of our schools, some of them in particular. Um, and again, can't say thank you enough for the community that provides us with funds to provide for children things that we can't afford as a school system. Um, so it, we appreciate every one of them. requesting approval on the agenda. Another opportunity is available for any subject at 515 uh, and at the end of the business. Um, so I have a green card, um, but it's not pertaining to anything on the agenda. So um, we might move that up if we, we, our agenda is short. So as soon as we're finished with the agenda, I'll call for citizens' comments and, and then we'll board. We still stay around until 515. Somebody else comes. Okay. Uh, educational services. Dr. Hebert. 
All the teachers are waiting to see which calendar won. Yes. <laughs> Mrs. Powell is going to share the calendar. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon. I'm here to ask for your approval of the revised 2020-21 calendar. As you know, last month, um, Ms. Himmel presented to you Plan A and Plan B, two different revised calendars that we put out to all staff members um, where they voted. And we had 1,077 votes, so it's around a third of our staff. Of those, 83% of them voted for Plan A, which if you remember, is the, is the thing you just got in front of you, is the one where November, that Thanksgiving break, is the complete week. And the last day for students and staff would be June 4th, um, the Friday in June. That doesn't surprise me. <laughs> doesn't mean. Yeah. I move that we uh, accept calendar A. Second. I have a motion by Mrs. Bryant and a second by Mrs. Powers to approve the um, new 2020 I believe I checked the postings today and we were at seven or nine teacher positions. So we are in a very good spot. This is the best spot we've been in in years as far as the beginning of the year. So, and we are still hiring. We've hired, we hired a few more teaching positions today. So very good news. So I ask for the board's approval of the instructional and support recommendations as listed on the golden rod. Move to approve instructional support recommendations um, as recommended on the golden rod. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Kennedy, a second by Mr. Dodd to approve the uh, staff personnel and instructional information on the golden rod. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Can you take uh, just a minute to let us know how we're doing with um, the balance of our teachers for brick and mortar and, and those that are on virtual, they're still all of our own teachers? Yes, that is correct. We have approximately 85, give or take one or two, that have transitioned to virtual school. They were our teachers that left the brick and mortar schools and transferred to virtual school. Um, I believe all of them, we, we do have a waiting list for the middle school, so if there are more openings at the middle school, we do have teachers that would like to transition, and we are balanced at the brick and mortar schools as well, so we'll be able to meet class size at the brick and mortar schools. And everyone was notified last Tuesday, okay. Tuesday or Wednesday, of where they would be. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So just the numbers as of right now, we have 1,748 students in elementary, 864 middle school students, and 1,020 high school students with a total of 3,632. We do have. Um, parents that have called after our deadline of uh, last Wednesday. So we are working through that. Um, again, trying to staff, we know that the high schools, middle schools and elementary schools want to do the best they can to staff their schools. So as we're getting more families coming in, we're trying to work through those one day at a time. Mrs. Taylor has been involved in that process, working with her staff to help um, work with our virtual staff to do that. So. We are doing our best to try and accommodate those families coming in, <coughs> although it is, you know, it's challenging at the last minute when a family makes a decision and, you know, that could totally change a whole schedule at one of our sites. Dr. Heber, is there any documentation, unique documentation that we are requiring in order to try and help with that transition to virtual? We're not asking for any documentation. However, we've had had parents that have reached out to us and said, I would like to go to virtual and 
I have um, a medical reason why I need to do that. So then we've contacted them back and say, what's the medical reason? And those kinds of conversations have occurred. But it's not something we're saying, if, if you would like to be in virtual, you must show a doctor's note. But if they've indicated that to us, then we are then asking, you know, can you tell us what's the unique circumstance that you're doing that? Some parents have just indicated they missed the deadline, they were not aware, variety of reasons. But we're trying to be as accommodating as we can, but we know that, for example, I believe right now we're looking at about 45 to 50 that are on our waiting list um, that happened from last week. So when you think about that, we take those students, put them into virtual, that then takes away from the brick and mortar, which then Ms. Swain then has to make a move of those teachers. Could change how schedules look at our middle and high school specifically. But we're working, we're doing the best we can to try and accommodate those families if we can. And then we might take this opportunity to mention those teachers that are doing double duty um, to accommodate the families and those special teachers in our academies that are going to stream classes, teach them, and then stream them to the virtual nets. I think this district has gone over and above um, to accommodate all of these kids. Right. We've really tried to put the information out to families to, to make a decision um, and decide. Um, I know that you know more information comes out, parents are making decisions, but we're really encouraging families. You know, we need to know sooner than later. You know, we can't wait till the first day of school and say, now I've decided I'd like to do Citrus Virtual. If a family knows, they need to make that decision now because that does impact the scheduling and what's offered at our schools. I've got a question. So, at what point is the waiting list, I mean, do we make the determination that we need to add another class where we need to take care of, of those numbers? And the only reason I'm asking is because literally, if, if it's not an option, then the option for those parents would probably be to go to Florida virtual, correct? That would be correct. And, and that would that would mean... And, and, and some families have indicated that, you know, when we said we'll put you on a waiting list, we've got to look at, at our, our data to see what we can do to fit you in. We're doing everything we can to make accommodate them. Some families have said if it comes to first day of school, some of them indicated I'm just going to homeschool. So they'll then speak to Ms. Humball's office, sign up for homeschool, and go that route. Some have indicated they'll work to go to Florida Virtual School, and there might be other providers out there that they could choose to do. We obviously want to keep them as part of Citrus Virtual as much as we can. We're just, we got to go through it day by day. One of the things we're working through is getting more virtual teachers. Ms. Swain sent out an email this morning to elementary principals to ask their staff for the last push to see if anybody wants to volunteer. As we move through this and we're hiring brand new teachers, we will probably have a conversation with them that you may be brick and mortar, but you may be virtual because that's the um, thing we're trying to do to get the class sizes down in virtual because they're, as far as we're concerned, too big. So we're just trying to get everybody scheduled and then we can see how many more teachers we'll need. And we do have some teachers that are doing their courses brick and mortar in the morning <coughs> or in the afternoon already. Mm -hmm. And we do have some teachers that are teaching on their planning period as well. So if we can make that work where they teach a class on their planning period, we've been there, done that. Correct. <laughs> we've provided those options. So they're teaching maybe brick and mortar all day and then virtual on their planning period. So we're looking every day. The executive staff has directed Brendan and I to look at those numbers every single day. So we get a report of the total number of students per school and then the ones that are enrolled in virtual programs at that school as well. So we're monitoring that very closely to make sure we meet class size, to, to look at the virtual numbers per grade level as well. And, and the community and the parents have to be very patient because they normally a master schedule is done by the end of school year. And here we are two weeks away from having the kiddos back in the classroom and we're still working with numbers. To you are correct. To accommodate them. And so, and then we're gonna be flexible after we get them. You are correct. Thank you. Under Scott, do you have that number for high school? Yeah. One thousand twenty. It has gone up. So one thousand twenty. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, informational items. Good afternoon. So, um, you have your cash and investment reports. We are still earning a little tiny bit of money on our um, 
our funds. Um, we have had to um, rely less on our investments this year to get through. We've been able to sustain um, on the tax income and the FEFP without having to move money out of our investments, so that's a good thing. Um, this time of year it gets lean. It'll get leaner as we get um, through about November when the, everybody starts paying their taxes for next year. So um, with that said, the budget update at this point, this is kind of our in-between board meeting. We had our temper, ten, tentative budget last at the board workshop. The next board meeting in September will approve the final budget. So um, the property appraiser should be sending out trim notices Monday is about the typical schedule time. Um, I can't determine exactly when they send those out, but that's about it. So um, we're just moving forward right now, working on working with HR to get all those numbers settled on how many teachers, you know, getting teachers put where they are so we can push a good final budget over personnel-wise. Um, we did have to go back to the drawing board on the CARES Act. So um, we spent some late nights last week getting that resubmitted. Um, they've been very stringent on only additional um, expenses we've incurred. So at this point, we're able to help the teachers that are on planning pay for those. Um, a lot of the supplies, which Ms. Blair did a nice little promo on Facebook of all the supplies we've been working on and ordering. and. We even have more that came in yesterday. The post office called and said, can you please come get this stuff that got shipped to you because we can't even get in our warehouse here. So the guys ran over and picked that up. So um, we sent out mask and hand sanitizers last week for all the staff. This week we've sent out face shields and thermometers to every school. Um, next week we will be sending out, I'm trying to think, we have so much stuff over there. Next week will be the mask and stuff for the students that we'll have available for them to get, you know, on the buses. And then the refill, the bot, the gallon jugs of hand sanitizer we bought to refill the individual bottles the teachers and the staff have. So that's been a very uh, laborious project of love by the finance and purchasing and maintenance and and risk management department to get it all right and get it within code and make sure we're not going to, um, you know, exceed any limits on that. So budget-wise, we're just kind of trucking along right now. So we will have uh, the final budget at the um, September board meeting. We'll vote on that. We'll have a 5.30 hearing again and do our nice little script so that we meet our trim um, requirements and um, that's about where we are. Do we have any questions of me today? All right. Thank you. Y'all have a good evening. Thank you. Um, Mr. Bradshaw is um, not here for te attorney legal meter, <laughs> attorney legal mappers. Um, so we'll move on to um, number 15, approval of the minutes. And I think it's okay if we. Move approval of June 23rd, 2020 and July 14th, 2020 of the special board meeting and the regular board meeting. Okay. I have a motion by Mr. Kennedy and second by Mrs. Bryan to approve the minutes from the June 23rd, 2020 special meeting and workshop and approve the minutes from the July 14th, 2020 regular meeting and public hearing. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It's got to be 5.15 somewhere. <laughs> because we are, we are through with our business and we do have one green card. So um, with that, uh, before we go to information from us, um, I'd like to give Mr. Flaherty a chance to make his comment. Hi, well, thank you. Terry Flaherty, I'm this primary school. With all, everything that's been going on, I understand the changes, every, changes everywhere. The one thing I've been thinking about that really is a concern to me, and it's staff leave, sick leave. If a student in a classroom is diagnosed positive for COVID, supposedly that classroom, the students, and the teacher have to be quarantined. My question is, where does that time that teacher's out come from? 
Is it the teacher's personal sick leave? Is it their personal leave? Does it come from the emergency sick leave? I've asked a lot of people, I talked to Mr. Baumler today, it seems to be a pretty good question. First, I was told it's a case-by-case -case situation. Well, I didn't buy that until talking to Mr. Baumler, then I understood a little bit more about the case-by-case. -case. But if Johnny is sick, Johnny gets tested positive in my class, and I've been with Johnny all day long, I'm out. First choice is to use the emergency sick leave. My thought is, this is meant for me being sick or my family being sick, not Johnny being sick and I'm collateral damage. But I'm covered. Situation, a month later, I have another student that tests positive. I've been with that student all day. Now, I can't use this anymore. There's nothing left for me to use except my personal sick leave. Now, as a staff member, I have to use my time because someone else is sick and I'm losing money because of it. There's got to be something in place that doesn't cost the staff member their sick leave time, their personal leave time, or money. If you look at it, there's a line of duty. If the the staff member catches head lice from a student, they're compensated. But if we get, if we're quarantined for no fault of our own, we have no symptoms, but we cannot come back to school, it's going to cost us. So I, after talking to Mr. Baumer, I wanted to bring it to, and I understood exactly what he's saying, and I, and, and I get the whole, you know, things are constantly changing, but I wanted to bring it to the board because if it were to happen to me, I'm going to come here and I'm going to fight for my time but I wanted you to be aware ahead of time, it could be a problem. And what options do we have as staff? What, op what options do you have as a board? So please think about that. Thank you. plans and different plans for the buses and those types of things, we have developed a video that we would like to share on all of our sites featuring um, the famous Dr. Hebert. Um, so we want to share that video with you all today and get your thumbs up so we move forward with it. Face masks will also be available for those who need one. 
everyone on our school campuses will be required to wear a face cover. However, there are exceptions. While eating and drinking, when a doctor's note is provided, when outdoors at social distancing, during strenuous activities like recess, when seated in the classroom while physically distanced, pre-K to second graders, however, is encouraged. In the hallways, you may see health and safety posters lining the walls, reminding students to wash their hands <coughs> regularly and to maintain social distancing. You may also see one direction markings on the floors and the walls indicating one-way traffic. In the classroom, students will be physically distanced as much as possible. Students will not be allowed to share supplies with each other. In many instances, items will be marked with students' names to make sure only one student is using that item. <coughs> lunch times will look a little different this year. Additional lunch times have been added to reduce the risk of exposure to students and staff. Students will use a touchless barcode scanning system. Food service employees will wear face coverings and gloves at all times, and all food will be prepackaged. Students will be spaced apart as much as possible and be socially distanced while walking through the lunch line. <coughs> Students will face one direction or sit outside for lunch when weather permits. Cleaning protocols will be followed in between each lunch period. There will be no water fountains available for use, so students and staff are encouraged to bring their own water bottles to school. The number of students allowed in the restroom at one time will be limited to allow for social distancing. Custodial staff shifts will be staggered to allow for increased cleaning of surfaces throughout the day. Elementary students will remain with their same cohort throughout the day. PE classes will be taught outside when weather permits and will follow CDC guidelines. Students will also be allowed to go outside for recess if weather permits and remain with their cohort. Schools will stagger recess time or location to avoid multiple classes in one area. Specific areas will be assigned to each group. All students will wash hands or use hand sanitizer before and after playground use. We hope this video answered many of your questions. However, we know you probably still have some. If you do, please contact your child's school. We'll also be releasing more information regularly leading up to the start of school. Be sure to follow all of our social media channels, including specific ones for your child's school. Thank you for watching, and we look forward to seeing our students on August 20th. Not to be specific about what Terry brought up, but we have discussed that and that we are looking at different cases on what we can do or can't do. Um, but we are going to put a strong push out to our staff because, as you know, I have bugged Tito every day for what the past two weeks, at least once a day, if not twice a day. But we cannot stress enough to our staff, six feet away, 15 minutes or more. So we, we're going to continue to push that out because, um, you know, Terry talks about getting from students, but our big concern also is our staff. And you know how simple it is to get the teacher's lounge. Everyone wants to sit around and, and eat together, do those types of things. Those days are over. We're, we're starting into a world that we've never been in before. Um, we built schools to be friendly. We built schools for parents to come in. We built schools for teachers and kids just to be small group activities and those and we're not going to be able to do that. So our big push is, as Tito has told me every time, when they start contract or contact tracing, are you six feet apart? Are you with them for 15 minutes or more? So those are things that we're going to encourage and encourage until they get sick of hearing about it. But it's so easy, as you all know, being in front of the classroom and wanting to wander through the kids and those types of things. So those days are over. Um, we are very sensitive to things that Mr. Flaherty brought up today. And we'll be working with those, as everybody hates us to hear, case by case. But it will have to be after the first time that a teacher either contracts it or something like that. Okay? And Ms. Hummel, if we, we get into having to provide that level of, of benefit, which I think we all recognize the challenge of that, and 
And Mr. Clary brings up an excellent point. How are we going to pay for that? Where is those funds come from? Do we have a, a budget for that? Or you know, what would we do to be able to fund that? Well, you know we don't have a budget for that. Um, so those are things we'd have to look at, the cost and how do we do that and, and things like that. So it will be looked at on a case by case, um, especially if the teacher gets it and then gets it again. Because we've asked Tito if you could get it again, and I don't think there's any proof out there to say you would never get it again. So, um, but I don't know if they've seen it where they've gotten the second time. So um, we'll just have to work through those as they come to us. But just a point of clarification, um, I thought Mr. Tito said to us at uh, the workshop that um, the letter, after we do the contract tracing and give you an idea, if you, you tell us the classroom, we'll tell you the, the class students, the teacher. Um, but the self-quarantining and the testing was voluntary for those in contact, and that's where we come in with the six feet apart, 15 minutes. Um, so. Would, would we require a teacher to be out 14 days if they chose not to self-quarantine if a kid in their classroom got COVID? There are several scenarios that we've had to work on today with yeah. the um, guidelines that we've sent out to the principals. You know, if they were um, direct contact with a student or if they were contact from a student's parent whose sister had it and those types of things. So there's all different scenarios, about 10 days, 14 days required and those types of things, whether they bring a note back if they've been tested. Um, a note back from the health department or doctor says they can come back and those types of things. So we've got guidelines for all staff to look at. Case was, by case. <laughs> was the, uh, I know when Mr. Mom was in talking about the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, was that, I know you had said some things um, apply but not others, so is that what we're talking about, that the 80 hours? Every, every employee will um, be allowed for 80 hours. Right. So we do have that. For the 10 time. days. So, so Mr. Flair is right. If he gets it first time, then he'll have those 10 days right. where he'll be able to um, self-quarantine. So that's still bad. If they haven't used it, you can only use it one time. It's only available one time. Okay. But we are, everything's good with that, with us honoring that. Correct. Yes, okay. Okay. Buses, the windows will be open. So, are you asking the buses and the no, I'm just talking about the classroom where you have, you're doing the construction. I'm wondering if construction right. protocols, okay. you know, change as a result of COVID too. I know that um, Mr. Stokes and them work very closely with all the groups coming in. Um, for the changes that they're making, and some of them have probably been applied to the COVID and different things like that. So I know he worked with those contractors and them very closely. And I think to I make sure that Mrs. Bishop say something about the HEPA filters being installed in our classrooms too. Mm -hmm. So um, you know we have we have some ducks work that we can we can. The filters are being changed more often than they have in the past. Correct. Those types of things. And I talked to them also about some remodeling. Sorry, I didn't understand. <laughs> We're taking off the roof. What are we going to say? <laughs> that I understood. <laughs> Mr. Kennedy, you have anything? Um, first of all, outstanding video. Um, Dr. Hebert, I'm sure, Lindsay, you had a lot to do with things behind the scenes. Um, I can't help but mention excellent camera. Whatever you used, it was super looking on the high aid. Um, I wanted to just share with the board, uh, this Friday, uh, Citrus County School District is hosting 
the Florida School Board Association's National School Board Association's uh, Delegates Assembly. We're having to uh, do this all remotely this year because normally it would be done where we have a delegation that sends up there and, and I'm actually part of it being on FSBA and so they said uh, we'd love to do it, we'd love to have you come remotely and I said great, where do I go? And they said well we want to talk to you about that because <laughs> Citrus is the most centrally located so with the help of staff um, we're going to uh, host a small delegation here Friday from about <clears throat> 1 to 4 and we'll be uh, voting on some of the national positions and and uh, policies and governances of the National School Board Association. So I'm excited to participate in that. If you happen to be around and you have your masks on, come over and visit us um, and say hello. And uh, so that, that's with that. I, I, I want to just uh, say again, um, you know, Mr. Clarity brings up with a lot, with it touches a lot of us because a lot of us have family members who are going to be students and teachers and staff members from our family and, and we're we're all got those same questions we're nervous um, we've got anxiety about it we uh, we wonder how we're going to figure this through <clears throat> but we are citrus county and the one thing we're not scared of is figuring it out and we're not afraid of hard work um, i am constantly impressed with <coughs> our staff with our parents and the teacher, I mean, and the students who come up on a regular basis saying, well, have we thought about this? Um, so thank you to all of the team. I know uh, I talked to uh, Dr. Hebert and Mr. Bittner earlier today about some questions, and we didn't necessarily have all of the answers worked out, but what was very clear is that we had very committed individuals that were going to make sure this gets worked out. And I will tell you, my position of talking to school boards around the state, nobody has this figured out. Any district that thinks that, oh yeah, we're good, we'll be fine when day one opens, is just not being realistic. And I think that that may be the biggest Achilles heel is for us to know we don't have all the answers and we're going to figure them out. So that's it, and thank you for it. I want to say something about how important it is that Thomas is is uh, here on Friday, and, and the FSBA has recognized Thomas and Central County School System as a place to be, a place to lead. Uh, every county has not received it. And of course, we have our superintendent, superintendent of the year for the whole state. We have some pretty good winners in this school system. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you. Mr. Dodd, can I say anything? Um, well, I'll expound a little bit on the FHSAA, which is meeting on Friday. Uh, it's going to be um, uh, determining uh, the return to play plan in the state of Florida. And I think that it would be a good thing for us to schedule something for the workshop um, in August so that we can further discuss our return to play for fall sports. Uh, one of the options, uh, there's three options before uh, the board, and there'll be a lot of discussion, but one of them is to resume uh, the fall sports schedule as of August 24th, and there's another one uh, that has um, some people, or that has some push behind it to wait and uh, change the start of sports until a date in November, and to make all the seasons shortened uh, so the season for winter sport or fall sports and then winter and spring sports will all have shortened seasons. Um, so those are some of the discussions. I think uh, there's also one of the options is to not have a state series uh, so that would not allow sports to compete for a state championship. Um, but I'm not sure how well that's going to go over. But that's going to be the topics for us on Friday to discuss. And like I said, we should have an answer uh, Friday, and I would hope that we could then take what the FHSAA recommends and look at how it applies to our county and what we can do here in Citrus County for our uh, our athletes. And uh, so uh, that's the only thing that I have. Okay. Do you need a workshop because our school board meeting would be on the 25th? Do you need a workshop earlier than that? Or well, that's the schedule. That's our workshop meeting, meeting though, right? Mm -hmm. On the 25th. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I, I'm Is that just saying. Right? Uh, yeah, that's fine. I, okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, 
I don't have a problem with that at all. For uh, I just thought it would be a good <coughs> topic again to discuss mm -hmm. in workshops because we're trying to get it out there. So that I think we, we said that it was okay on the 24th when they were going to start some of their practices, right? When did we do that? Uh, no, I don't, I don't believe that's, that's changed. I think. Has that changed already? That's why we have to be flexible, compassion with grace. I don't think, I, I think FHA, FHSAA, Mr. Dodd, has, at this point, the 24th is still a date. That's correct. I mean, it's not necessarily what a district is obligated to do if they, for example, were following the SMAC. It could be the first possible uh, date to start sports if the, if the board votes, if the FHSA board votes for that. The, SMAC, the Sports Medicine Advisory Committee is meeting today uh, to look at, at some other information on sports and on age groups and so I'm not sure how that's going to come about with what comes to that meeting today um, but obviously there are school districts that um, weigh heavily the SMAC report um, and that's something that we would need to uh, talk um, with uh, Tito I see Tito Rubio is here with us appreciate you being here but something that we would have to look at for our athletes because if we were to follow the positivity rate of 5% for 28 days, we may not have a football season this year. Um, I think Hernando is following it right now, which is part of the challenge, because if we have a GA agreement, it's kind of dependent on what Hernando does, right? And I think that right now, from what I understand, they can definitely postpone sports in Hernando until a later date, so. I think they left open, though, if they, if they did get in that window of you know, if, they, if their numbers drop down, but yeah. but I would I would agree with what you're saying. But certainly we could look at um, you know I think they're going to look at volleyball maybe not being the um, the high risk sport that that football is, and so that could change for volleyball. I don't know. This is going to you know this is the sports medicine advisory committee is meeting today, and then we'll have more information this week, um, and it'll be presented. Does the board of directors have to take one of those three recommendations, or can they also come up with something? No, we can adjust. You can adjust it to do whatever. Okay, that's what I, I thought. And the date that was presented for that option three was actually November thirtieth, uh, which would be after Thanksgiving, and you know, so but that was not meant to be in stone. That was not meant to be. A, this is the date that a lot of people have looked at it that way, but it could be that uh, that third option could be. Um, starting sooner before November 30th, but that's all up for discussion. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's a lot, a lot of uh, information that we still have to get and, and look at. And of course, there's a lot of individuals who don't like that plan because it impacts all the other sports um, and shortens those seasons. And so there's a lot of passionate people out there, and some communities have not been affected by coronavirus as, as bad as other communities have. Um, but that's those would be discussion items for the board. So. And in those meetings, do you discuss the Title IX options? Uh, I mean, are we still going to be tied to? Oh, Title IX is always followed. So, no. yeah, I mean, yeah. But I mean, Boys, yeah, we're not going to reduce the number of girls' sports <laughs> at all. No. Okay. That, that'll but if, if those sports aren't scheduled or they don't get to play, Title IX certainly can be a factor somewhere along the line. So, are they going to be a little lenient and? Uh, no, I don't no. think so. I, I think no. we'll be we're following, we'll be following Title IX all the way, okay. all the way through. <coughs> so, Mr. Dodd, are you meeting, uh, are, are, you, are you in Zoom meetings? No, we're going to be in person on Friday. In person, Friday. okay. And, and yours is in person on Friday. Well, five of us will be here in person, okay. but we'll be, the rest of the delegates around the country will be done virtually gotcha, in gotcha. the state. Okay. But Mr. Dodd's the one that I think is the big one that they're doing in person. That was kind of been a big in Gainesville. Right? And how many, how many people will be in that meeting? They will limit the room to 50 according to Lachlan County uh, guidelines. Okay. And how many, how many serve on your committee? 16. Okay. Thank you so much. Hello, microphone. Turn around with the microphone. Well, this is all the governed um, schools under FHSAA, so it actually impacts middle school sports as well. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, 
what we're talking about for the state series is the high school sports. State series means there's a state playoff uh, and state championship. So the state series is such a challenge because of South Florida. It seems like that's that's probably going to be the biggest thing that weights on people's minds. Well, like I said, different parts of the state have definitely been impacted differently, and but there's a lot of passionate people out there when it deals with sports. And, but in light of all this, then we look at the national, uh, the NCAA, and what's happening at the college football level with things changing there. And you know, that's Big Ten yesterday announcement, and I think Pac-12. They just did. They, they just, just canceled. canceled. Yeah, they just so, canceled. You know, but again, that's not. We're not dealing with that at the NCAA right. level. But it is interesting to see um, how uh, things are. It's impacting the recruiting. It does. It all has a, it, and that's the part that I don't think people realize. And I, I don't envy you all because it's, it's a tough call, and I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. Tough, yeah. One other thing, though, is um, Tom and I are involved in swimming. We know the venues for state, and those venues have been contracted for a long time. There's not going to be any financial impact for cancellations there. No. No, there's not going to be fines uh, for that. <laughs> That's all I have. Okay. Thank you, <coughs> thank you for what you do with our, for our kids and our sports. Absolutely. Mrs. Bryant? Yes. I, I don't know how many of you remember. I don't, will remember him, but uh, J.M. Holtzclaw was the school board member from, from Swanee County, and he passed away earlier this week with a heart attack. He was a great man. It's kind of sad. Kind of sad. Um, I don't have anything else. That's all I have. Well, I just have to reiterate. I'm so proud as I'm listening to the news <laughs> that we're Citrus County. Yes. We don't have all the answers. We're not going to have any answers, but we remain flexible. We've offered all kinds of options to our kids and our families. Um, and I appreciate the, the feedback uh, that we're getting from, from our uh, teachers and our families. And so patience, compassion, grace, um, and if everybody, you know, I just see this maybe as the, we can take a lesson and teach these people that, I mean, I live on the Homosassa River and there were five boats tied up together in front of my house last Sunday afternoon. And it, it probably within maybe 100 feet at the most. But side by side, kids, adults, hopping from boat to boat, no masks. I guess they think they're okay because they're outside. I went to Publix a week and a half ago, and there were two old men in there, not together, but two old men should have had masks, some didn't have masks. So I'm thinking if we pull this off as a school system, maybe we can teach people that masks, hand washing, sanitizers, distancing does work. Um, and I'm hoping that uh, people will pay attention to that. We've got to be alert, and we've got to be consistent in those expectations of our teachers and our kids. Um, <laughs> Chief Grant sanitizing his hands back there. <laughs> um, but I think I think we could we have an opportunity here to show the community that that we can pull this off. Um, and I think, Mr. Tito, am I correct in assuming that 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 Mr. Flaherty is not mandated to, to take the 14 day um, if he feels good, is he okay to come to the classroom? So, in my comments to you, how I see the review of the Citrus County Health Department. So, in my comments to you is we have requested voluntarily that people quarantine themselves. Now, if an individual does not want to follow our request and we feel that they are a threat to the public, we can request a court order from the state yeah. and have that individual then ordered into quarantine. So hopefully we haven't done that yet in Citrus County, have not had that need, um, but the 14 days is, it takes 14 days to incubate the um, virus in anybody's body, in two to 14 days only. So sometime in that period you could become infectious or actually get the disease. That's why we ask you to quarantine for 14 days. Um, and this point is well taken. You can be a contact today and a month later, 30 days later, you can be a contact again. And you will be asked to quarantine again for 14 days. 
So I think that was the point he was making. The point about being a positive case and being infected a second time, that's a separate question that right now we haven't seen that in the county. I haven't had an instance of someone who was positive uh, and then maybe, you know, because again, this we're only in five months into this disease and we're thinking, as you've read, immunity could wane somewhere between three and six months. So as we get to the seventh and eighth month, maybe we'll see some people who might get infected again. Don't know if that's going to happen, but right now we haven't seen that. So that, that's where we are today. That answer your question? Yes. Thank you. How, how will a person know um, that they have immunity? They have to have a blood test done? Is that how they figure out they have antibodies? Right. To see if you have uh, immunity, um, you would want to have an antibody test. So there's three kind of tests you're going to hear us talk about, which is the PCR, heard me talk about that one, antigen, which is a test that tests for the virus, but not for the DNA of the virus or the RNA of the virus, but it tests for a protein from that virus. And then the third test is an antibody test. And antibody tests, we are not doing at the county health department. Um, you can get an antibody test from one blood if you donate blood, they are doing it there. Or your doctor can order an antibody test and you can go to LabCorp Quest. They do those kind of tests. And they have to run an antibody. By the way, I just got to give a plug for LifeSouth. Oh, LifeSouth, too. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're <laughs> absolutely right. Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, um, one blood just was first, and that's why that possibly worked. But Life, <laughs> LifeSouth is doing it. And again, like I said, your doctor can request that order. You can go to a, a, a laboratory, like LabCorp Quest, or wherever your, your provider is, and, and have that test done there. And uh, that's an IgG or an Ig. It's an IgG and IgA, if I recall, the two antibodies that they're looking for. And that really, an antibody is telling you that you are either currently exposed to the drug, to the virus, and that's why you have antibodies in your body, or you were exposed to the virus. So an antibody test is not. We don't use antibodies for current disease. We want to do either an antigen test or we want to do a PCR. And that tells us currently that you have the virus. Now again, with PCR, the thing with PCR is once you clear the virus, you may be positive PCR tests for months. Okay, because PCR is not testing for live virus, PCR is testing for the RNA of the virus. See the difference? Where, where the antigen um, is testing actually for proteins. So it, it, it becomes very difficult. That's why we are no longer moving towards a test-based clearance, we are moving towards a symptom-based clearance, which is 10 days, if you, if you have mild symptoms of the disease, 10 days after your onset of symptoms, without 24 hours, without a fever, without taking any medication to reduce that fever, and your symptoms are improving, you are cleared from the virus, as far as that's concerned. So we would, as a health officer, would write a letter stating that you've been cleared of the virus and you can give that to your employer or wherever you want to show that you are cleared from the virus. And, and right now we're having some issues with that in some of our community partners and uh, businesses that are requiring individuals to have a negative test and they've come back and they've been tested two or three times and they've come back positive and uh, we're, we're trying to show those individuals that, that that's not the way to go because these people will test positive for months. Some of us will clear the virus and, and, and we'll get that negative test, but, but we're seeing more and more that not happening. As we with, this, with the amount of testing that we're doing, that's what we're seeing. And it's still taking about three days to get the results? It takes about uh, uh, 48 to 72 hours when you test with the county health department. Mr. Rubio, you go, oh, sir. Please. Um, rapid testing. Um, and and I, I want to pair it because it was something you just mentioned a second ago having to do with. Uh, clearing by symptoms as opposed to by tests. Rapid testing and asymptomatic testing, um, because the use of, ace of rapid testing for asymptomatic, it seems like rapid testing has a, has a place somewhere. Um, asymptomatic testing is sometimes usage is, is questionable. It sounds like there's different theories on it. So, so Let's look at rapid testing if I have symptoms. So if I have some kind of symptom, I have a fever, or I've, had, I've developed a, a, a sustainable cough that came out of nowhere, 
um, or or I have a loss of taste or smell or you know some of those things that lead us to COVID that make us sick of COVID. So rapid testing would be a way to say instead of me waiting 10 days because I just gave you the example if I have COVID or if I have symptoms like COVID and I can then assume that I have COVID. Well, if I waited the 10 days then I'm clear. But if I had a way to rapid test myself and I'm having symptoms, that's the important part. Then I could show by a rapid test that I don't have the virus. Now, I'm asymptomatic, so I have no symptoms at all. And I get tested. Well, if I just got tested because I wanted to get tested, then the test, and I was negative, then I just continue on like I was before I did the test, which is I'm just a normal person walking around the community and I don't have COVID. Now, that's one example. But let's say the example that I always get asked. Well, I'm a contact to a case, and I want to get tested. So then when the results come back negative, I can go back to my normal routine. And the answer to that is if you get tested prior to the 14 days, you may be negative because the disease hasn't incubated in your body. And we didn't wait long enough to see if you're going to be positive or not. That's why a positive or even a rapid test at that point really doesn't help. You can get it, that's okay. You come out to our test site, we test everybody that shows up. Don't ask you any questions. But again, you have to ask why are we testing. That's, that's the important part, right? So, so that's where the rapid testing, I was hopeful that it would have some impact in getting our staff back to work um, in, in an exposure type situation or contact situation. But you're saying you're still waiting the time because the symptoms could still show up. Right, right. It takes it takes 14 days for that. It could take up to 14 days for that disease to incubate your body for you to have a symptom. Now, if you already, if if you are, some more scenarios. Okay, so I was a contact. Four days later, I start developing the symptoms. Right, I start having a fever, and then I decide to get tested. You know, let's say a day or two later, and the test comes back negative. When we go back to revert, remember I told you if you if you have symptoms, we would assume you have COVID, and if we assume you have COVID and the test is negative, now we know you don't have COVID. So you see the difference of the scenario. How this I know. It's, it, trust me, my brain has been wrapping around this for the last week. On all the scenarios of how it's going to be, but it's been a good drill because it's really tried to make it very clear to us, especially in the school situation that we're talking about. How are we going to proceed with that? But again, so asymptomatic, I'm testing just a test. Test comes back negative. And that just means you can keep on going with your life like you were before you were tested. Testing because I'm a contact to a case doesn't mean anything. 14 days. Testing because I have symptoms, that's a different story. Now you're testing because we think you may have, you have a possibility of having COVID. The test then will tell us whether you do or not. Does that help? Kind of yeah. walk that line. It's not an easy line. Yes, yeah, that's very. Uh, I mean, it sounds like you've got it worked out. I don't know if I have it all quite worked out yet. <laughs> yeah. We will again. We will look at it case by case yeah. with that scenario to apply these principles that are on CDC principles that we're following. It's not something I said before that Mr. Rubio made up. Right. But, you know our CDC guidelines that we're following to do. That. So, but Tito, what you're telling us then is that the child does come back positive in the schools and you start your contact tracing, you start to find out who that child was around. If that child is, has exposed another child, then... Or, or had the possibility. Or had the possibility. Yeah, had the possibility. So the right. other child didn't have a mask on and close contact. Or, 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 right, or, or, the, or the, the scenario of the cohorting, like you were saying, we have a cohorted class. I may not be able to make sure that that Johnny wasn't next to Susie, who was across the room or not, then I would have to assume as a health officer, all these children could be contacts, and as we do with any disease. Right, and then they would be out for 14 days. We would send a letter to all the parents, that's correct. We, we would consider them as a contact, and we would proceed that way, yes. And even if they're not showing symptoms, though they still need to be out for 14 days. They're a contact. They're a contact, and because the incubation period is 14 days. Right, it could be two to 14 days before we see symptoms. And would we teach them virtually at this time? Scott. That would be your. Canvas is coming in. That just blew in my brain. I'm sorry. Maybe we could then enact the emergency distance learning plan. 
so they would they would follow that plan if we had to do that, which would be using Canvas. Not necessarily getting ill, just the due well, contact, contact. Oh, they right. have to contact. be quarantined. Well, what if that, te that teacher contacts other teachers, like at lunch or something like that, then how? So, how so, 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 so again, a contact is, de is, is defined as you are in contact with a positive case. So if I'm a contact and you, con you know, you're the case, I'm a contact. But I also had contact with you, right? You are not a contact. You didn't have contact with the case. You would be a contact if I get symptoms and I get sick, then you would be a contact. Okay, so a contact to a contact, I will tell you right now, everybody in this room, we all have been a contact to a contact. There's enough widespread of this disease in our community, we've probably all been a contact to a contact. But we're not ill. We haven't gotten sick. Does that, does that clear that question up? Okay. Trust I get asked that one a lot too. And that's okay. Any, anything else? I was just picturing all the teachers going out with that. Right. But, but I mean, you brought up a very good point. You really, really did. So. Yes. Thank you so much, Mr. Mm -hmm. for the next 14 minutes and we'll read uh, a... Reconvene. Re